You have no rival. You have no equal. No name could possibly compare to the name that is above all names. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. You are Lord. God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would just release everything of the Spirit of God that you want us to experience today, God. Teach us, convict us, call us, encourage us, change us. God, in everything that the enemy wants to use to hinder your work, we say no to in the name of Jesus Christ. We just declare this an open place for the Spirit of God to move and to speak. In this great name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please be seated if you would. About 10 years ago, I was in Uganda riding around with my son Luke. We were on a mission trip ministering to... uh, orphans, AIDS uh, patients. I was doing some training with pastors. We're riding through the back country of Uganda and in the back of a Jeep. And our driver was a brand new Christian. He owned one CD and he played it over and over and over and over and over again. And he had just become a Christian, so there's one song on that CD that had a Christian message, and that was from that great theologian, Shaggy, who uh, had this song, Repent, 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 because we're two steps away from a great disaster. They think they're the boss, but who are the master? Life set a pace, everything much faster, need to slow down and pray. Forgive them. Repent, 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 repent. Until I don't have too many shaggy fans here. Uh, but on the play ride home, I just kept hearing that song in my head. Repent, 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 repent. And I mean, what do I need to repent of? I just flew halfway across the world to take the gospel to the hurting and the needy. I said, God, is there anything I need to repent of? And the Holy Spirit began to point things out in my life that were less than godly. Today we're going to look at a passage of Scripture which, if you really get into it, I imagine it's going to cause you to look at your life a little differently and maybe in such a way that you will join me and Shaggy and repent, 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 and repent. Turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. We're talking about knowing God, and uh, today we're going to talk about knowing God on a whole different, deeper level. Not just to know about God but to experience God at a level that is life-changing. And I just want to say to you, don't be a person that just goes to church and goes through the motions. Be a person that experiences the living God. He's awesome. And experience Him in such a way so that it wrecks your life. It changes you. It changes you from the inside out. It, it sets you on fire. Say, on fire. On fire. On fire for him. So Isaiah chapter 6, you got a young man. Uh, he's very young at this point, and he's looking at his nation, which is strong militarily. At this point, it's strong economically but spiritually is rotting on the inside. Uh, There's cancerous corruption. There's sores of sexual immorality, idolatry, religion without a real relationship with God. There's uh, ungodly leadership. Reality is 
Israel at that point is a lot like the U.S. is right now. And if you're not awake, uh, you won't, you, you'll be blind to the fact that America is, is a mess on the inside. We're celebrating sin. Well, obviously, I've lived in Vegas for uh, several years where they celebrate sin. And, and to live in a culture where sin is celebrated and to see the, the brokenness that comes as a result is uh, devastating. Not just in the hood, but in the suburbs. Well, here you have a young man who passionately loves God. And I mean, he wants to see his nation come back to God. I wonder, is there anybody in this room who would be like Isaiah and say, my heart burns to see our nation come back to God? He wants to make a difference. He's burning to make a difference. And God is so gracious, God gives him an incredible experience. And this experience evokes a response of several statements out of him that he cannot help but utter. The first one is, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. This is a cry of realization. Because when he sees God, he realizes God is holy. Isaiah 6.1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died... I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. He sees God on the throne of the universe. I saw the Lord. Incredible, incredible thing. And what's interesting in this chapter is he never tries to describe God because God's indescribable. God is infinite. Uh, how do you describe the infinite? I mean, you can throw words at it. Awesome, huge, immense, amazing, glorious, majestic. But it doesn't even, doesn't even scratch the surface of what he saw. God is indescribable. And to our minds, really, the more you know about God, you realize he's incomprehensible. It's, he's so kind to give us little pictures of who he really is, but who he is in his purest essence is beyond our brain's ability to comprehend. We can only guess at what he saw. We know from other passages of Scripture that, that he's looking into the, 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 the face of holiness. He's seeing lights of, of, of love and purity there's, there's rivers of, of wisdom rolling past him and life. There's oceans of love flowing over top of him. There's torrents of truth swirling around him. He's seeing a good shepherd. He's seeing a great physician. He's seeing a heavenly father. He's seeing the king of kings. He's seeing all of that and much, much more. And it says he's seated on a throne. This throne, you know, you've seen the thing in, in Washington with Lincoln on that giant, uh, sitting on that giant chair, big white throne. Well, imagine, this would be like a billion times bigger if God chose to reveal himself that way. Immense, huge. And we know from other writers of Scripture that, that this throne is coming off of it, it's it's wrapped in jewels, and there's, there's rainbows of color, uh, vibrant color exploding all around. There's glorious light. It's overwhelming. And then he says, even he describes, he, he's trying to describe something that, that, that he can comprehend. He says, the train of his robe filled the temple. Imagine this lush, glorious robe of the king of kings, the, the, the rich colors of purple and, and red and gold, and it would be amazing. He says, I saw the Lord. If that's not enough, he says in verse 2, above it, the throne, seraphim. Each with six wings, two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, two he flew. Seraphim. Now, that's a Hebrew word. 
They didn't even try to translate it. That's just the Hebrew word. The I am is plural. The seraph means burning, so it means burning ones. These are super special angels who are literally burning all the time. They're asbestos. They never burn up. They just burn all the time. They're, they're blazing all the time. Why are they blazing all the time? Hebrews tells us that our God is a consuming fire. A consuming fire. We don't like to picture God that way. That's not the, the side of God we want to deal with. But that is what is. God is, is, is a burning, consuming fire. And if we don't get the picture of that, he goes into it in verse 3. He says, And one cried out to another, to another, back and forth, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. These angels are flying above the throne of God, burning and perpetually saying to one another, Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I can't wait to see that. I'm not, I can't even imagine what that's like. They, they're flying perpetually. They're continuously in the presence of God. They're worshiping unceasingly, and they're making a declaration that you get the idea they cannot help but say. They're in the presence of this amazing, amazing being, and the words just have to come out, holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I imagine they're saying it in, in all sorts of languages and in different uh, uh, chanting tones, and, and it, it, it's going to be phenomenal. Think about this. Moment by moment, hour by hour, day after day, week after week, year after year, decade after decade, century after century, millennial after millennia, these angels have been crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with His glory. That's amazing. And they'll be doing that forever because He deserves it. His very essence deserves that, demands that, draws that out of us. The word holy, um, we don't use the term much, really. But it means separation, and the idea is twofold. One, that God is so beyond anything we can imagine, there's a separation between who he is and everything else. And then the other essence of that word is there's a separation from sin. God is, is holy and separate from all sin. In fact, God has never, the only time sin and God ever met was on the cross 2,000 years ago. When Jesus Christ, the Son of God, <laughs> Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the pure, holy, sinless Son of God, took my sin and your sin and the sin of all people, and God dumped it out on him like a massive dump truck of sewage. And he experienced our sin. But notice what Jesus said when that happened. He said, my God, my God, you have separated yourself from me. We need to not take lightly the amazing holiness of God. If you're going to know God, you've got to know the whole package. And the, 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 a core aspect of the package is that God is holy. Interesting, if we were to survey evangelical Christians in America, and this has been done, what's the greatest number one attribute of God? The answer would be love. Everyone would say love. God is love. Jesus loves me. Thank God for that. But those that are closest to him don't cry out, love, love, love. They cry out, holy, holy, holy.
You know, the church in America is weak. Christianity in America is declining, and I think part of it has to do with we've just lost the sense of the holiness of God. And as a result, we're, we're seeing all the consequences rolling through. Chapter 6 and verse 4, it says, And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. The, the glory of God is such that it, the Shekinah is like smoke, and, and these angels are crying out. I want you to notice they're not going, Holy, holy, holy. They're going, holy, holy. Their voices are booming like thunder, and it's shaking the building. They're having a God quake all the time. You know, in Acts chapter 4, when they, they were being persecuted and they went back to God and prayed, they didn't say, take away the persecution. They said, give us boldness, and the Holy Spirit shook the house. You know, I'd like to see, I'd like to see a God quake at First Baptist Church. Every Sunday where God is moving on such a level that, that there's a whole lot of shaking going and shaking out the bad, and shaking in the good. I saw the Lord, Isaiah says. I saw the Lord, and he crushed it. Look at the next thing he says, number two. Woe is me. Woe is me. It's a cry of confession. I have sinned, he says. Verse 5, and he said, woe is me, I, I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I've heard people talk about, well, when I see God, I'm going to ask him this, 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 and this. I've heard comedians make jokes about what they're going to say to God. I don't think so. going to be on their faces. Not going to be smart-mouthing God. Going to be trembling, looking at him through their fingers. You say, Dave, I don't like that picture. We use the word awesome all the time. It doesn't mean anything much anymore. I mean, hamburger's awesome, right? The word used to mean something. It means full of awe. Something that draws awe. God is such that he draws awe out of everything around him. They are in awe. I've seen the Grand Canyon. You stand there, you don't say anything. You just look. You're in awe. What does is, what is Isaiah said? He says, woe is me. Now, that's a very nice translation. The Hebrew says, I am condemned to hell forever. I am condemned to hell. You know, I, I'm a pastor. Hebrews says I have to give account of souls. I don't like that part. Look at me. I have a deep desire that nobody in this room goes to hell. You can't, you can't add Jesus to your sin and think that that's going to work before a holy God. You can't do your thing and get to receive his thing. If you don't want all of God now, you're not going to get all of God later, which is what heaven is. You can't use, do your life, your way, have it your way. Now, he created us to have it his way. I'm damned, condemned, guilty. Literally what it says. And then he says, I am lost. That's kind of weak too. Some of your Bibles say, I'm ruined. The word means, literally, I am melting. The old uh, Wizard of Oz movie where the witch gets the water thrown on her and she goes, I'm melting, I'm melting. 
This, that, this word means I am melting. I am melting. The presence of God is so intense. The holiness of God is so literal, so real, that I am just melting like a puddle in his presence. Have you ever had an experience with God that puts you on your face? In Vegas, we used to do a five-day burn. We called it a burn. We'd start in the morning, go to noon, worship and pray, worship and pray, go into the afternoon, do a few hours at night. Usually by Thursday, Wednesday, no, about Tuesday or Wednesday, there would be a day when God would put everybody in the room on their face. Try to take pictures of it. It doesn't look right. To see people just plastered on the floor because you, you're just on your face before the king of kings. And then by Thursday night, it'd be awesome. We'd come to, to gather and everybody would be dancing because you've been free. They say Vegas is the, the place of the best parties in the world. Well, I'll tell you what. When you deal with a real God in a real way, you're going to end up on the other side with the best party in the world. Um, he says, woe is me. Several years ago, I went on a spiritual retreat, and I spent a couple days in a hotel with God. And uh, the first day was filled with praise and thanksgiving. And the morning of the next day, I said, okay, God, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. I've been spending three days with God all alone. How about that? I said, okay, God, is there anything I need to confess? Boom. I just start writing down things. Wrote down about ten things right away, and I'm like, okay, okay. Holy Spirit, you got anything else? Ended up with 40-some things on my list. I, uh, I printed the list for you. And what I want you to understand is this. Hey, you ever, you ever uh, drive your car and it's a sunny day and you realize your windshield is filthy? You know what I'm talking about? Because the sun, the light, exposes every bit of darkness. Listen to me. When you're close to God, you don't want any little sins in your life. When you're not close to God, you're tolerating all sorts of junk and view it as acceptable. It's normal. Okay, the sinful life is not the normal Christian life. Let me read the list to you. Addiction, anger. Anxiety, apathy, arrogance, bad-mouthing others, bitterness, cheating, complacency, complaining, despair, discouragement, dishonesty, dishonoring others, doubt, envy, exaggeration, fault-finding, fear, fighting, gluttony, gossip, greed, harshness, hatred, idolatry, impurity, immorality, ingratitude, jealousy, laziness, lying, lust, rebellion, robbing God, selfishness, selfish ambition, self-righteousness, stealing, stubbornness, undependable, ungodliness, worry. When we accept these things as the normal Christian life, we're missing it. Woe is me, he said. I'm a man of unclean lips. I, I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And then God's gracious, verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand a burning coal he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Fire does two things. It can either consume and burn, or it can cleanse and purify. The angel took the, toll off the, 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 the coal off the altar and burnt his lips with a purifying, temporary cleansing. 739 years later, the Son of God hung on a cross and shed his blood and died so that we can experience a permanent cleansing of our sin. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. It's for my sins and your sins that Jesus suffered such a terrible, terrible thing. Lied about, rejected, denied, abandoned, beaten, whipped, spiked to a cross, spit upon, mocked, rejected, hated for us. Interesting, this same Isaiah, when he was my age, in chapter 53 wrote about Jesus he, uh, looking ahead, 700 years ahead. He said, he's despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. Surely he's borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was put upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. You know, when you really see God, it's going to fire you up in love with Jesus. The cross... When we do the Lord's table, it's going to bring tears to your eyes when you think about what he's done for us. Woe is me, he said. I am undone. If you're not a follower of Jesus, I, I, I just beg you, run to Jesus. Be cleansed. Be forgiven. Let your sins be paid for through his death and his blood for you. You are a follower of Jesus. I beg you, run to Jesus. Be cleansed. Be forgiven. Be changed. Repent. 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 Repent means a serious change of mind that leads to a total change in direction. Have you experienced that? Well, there's a third statement. He said, here am I, send me. This is a cry of availability. Send me, he says. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who will I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here am I, send me. When God looked, you know, just as the angels are perpetually crying, holy, 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 God is perpetually crying, who will I send and who will go? Just as the angels cannot help but look at God and they cannot help but say, holy, 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 God looks at the world and he cannot help but say, who's going to go tell them? Who's going to go save them? Who's going to go help them? You don't get close to God without hearing a, a cry, a calling to the world, to others, to missions, to ministry to evangelism. Dude, if you've never told anybody about Jesus, let me ask you a sincere question. Do you even know him? Have you met him? Come on. Who will I send? Who will go? You say, well, I like Jesus. Well, Jesus is the ultimate missionary left heaven, came to earth. Jesus' last prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one, and you send them into the world as I have sent them into the world. John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, I send you. Turn to the person next to you and go, you are sent. You've been sent. So the question isn't, well, I don't know that I've been sent. No, you've been sent. The question is, are you going? Every true follower of Jesus has a missionary call. The question is, are we going? Are we obeying it? God calls some people across the oceans. God calls all of us across the street. You've been sent. Who will I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I. Hebrew. What's that mean? It means not like here. 
It means, not like you in class going, yeah, my body's here, but my mind is somewhere else. This is saying, I am completely 100% all in available here. Have you ever said that to God? I am completely 100% all in available here for you to use however you desire. You know, you know, you, if you're really going to do it, you got to really do it. Christianity doesn't really work halfway. You got to get all the way in. You got to jump all the way in. Here am I, send me. Last one, God's voice. Go and tell. The cry of accountability. God says, go and tell somebody. Go and tell. I believe that just as the angels are crying, holy, 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 God is crying, who will go? And then when we hear, he says, go and tell. Matthew 16, verse 15, go into all the world and preach the good news. Matthew 28, 19, go and make disciples. Acts 1, 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Here am I, send me. God says, go and tell. What's this look like? This looks like you just being honest with God, open with God, available to God, vulnerable before God, not worrying about what anybody else thinks but you and God. What's this look like? You going from that point with a clean life on a commission. When uh, Kathy and I were first married, I was the campus pastor at Liberty University. I got up one morning, and my devotions, I read this passage, Isaiah 6. I tried to pray the scripture. I said, okay, God, I confess sin. I tried to really get there, and I said, okay, God, here am I, send me. And when I prayed it, I really didn't think a lot about it because I was going to work at Liberty Mountain with everybody in my office were like, the campus pastor's office. Everybody's a Christian. Everybody I was going to meet that day was going to be a Christian. I'm like, God, here am I. Send me. I forgot all about it. You ever pray a prayer and forget about it? But God did not forget about it? Starting about 10 o'clock in the morning, I get this repeating thought in my head. Go to the mall, get a haircut. Go to the mall, get a haircut. Now, you got to realize, being the campus pastor was not a well-paying job at that time. And we were saving money to go plant a church. I'm like, I don't want to go to the mall and get a haircut. It's expensive there. And I can pay some student a couple bucks, and who cares? Go to the mall, get a haircut. I don't want to go to the mall and get a haircut. People don't like Christians in that mall. And uh, I don't want to have to have that conversation with somebody that doesn't like God. Go to the mall, get a haircut. Go to the mall, get a haircut. Finally, I'm a little slow. It's like, I think God wants me to go to the mall and get a haircut. So I go to the mall. I walk in, and you got to realize, this was years ago. There's only one chair open in the mall salon, and the chick behind it has got to be the wildest-looking woman I'd ever seen in my life. This was years ago, and she had tats and metal and and things I didn't even know you could do to yourself. And her hair was, was like Medusa, dressed all in black. I'm thinking, this is not going to go well. She's going to ask me my name, and she's going to ask me where I work. What's your name? My name is Dave. Where do you work? What do you do? I'm the campus pastor of Liberty University. She goes, oh, my God, I hear that behind me. I'm thinking, she's armed, I'm unarmed. (laughs) Oh, my God, this is not going to go well for me. And then I hear this behind me. (laughs) I turn around, and, man, she's cutting loose. I'm like, ma'am, what's wrong? Listen very carefully to what she said. She said, I got up this morning and I told God, if he didn't send a Christian to talk to me today, I was going to kill myself tonight.
Jeremiah seventy eight. Remember her and her <laughs> come to our group. There's people hurting all around. But I'll tell you, when you when you got sin in your life, it shuts your mouth. Shuts your mouth. Closes your eyes. Turns you in. And you're missing it. Look, God loves you today. God's not against you. He's for you. And his arms are open. <laughs> he wants you to come to him. Bring your stuff. Get clean. Get clean. Get refreshed. Jump into that cool, refreshing grace. And mercy. We've been praying a lot this week. The voice of God would be clearer and louder in this room, deeper. And I believe it is. We've been praying that you would have your heart more open. Less, less inhibited. More responsive. We're going to bow our heads and just in this silence right here, God's talking. I'm going to say these altar, this not this place to come kneel or stand is open. And I'm going to invite you to just come and do, do business with God. Come and do business with God. Maybe you need to come and say, woe is me. Maybe you need to come and say, here I am, sinner. begin, let the band quietly begin. The invitation is open to you. Whatever that looks like, you respond to God. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. 